Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will now begin our panel discussion. And so first, I would like to introduce all our panelists this evening. And as they come up and get mic'd, I, I'll give you a brief bio of everyone who's here. So why don't we all come on down? And as we get set up, uh, first I would like to introduce Mr. Evan Sanchez, who is an entrepreneur with his sights set on the long-term renaissance of Atlantic City. For nearly a decade, starting from his time at Columbia University, Evan has worked in leadership positions in management and sales. Evan returned to his hometown of Atlantic City in 2015, and in his efforts to promote positivity, he co-founded This Is AC, a nonprofit's grassroots community movement. He also serves as president of the Atlantic City Arts Foundation, president of the Atlantic City Community Fund, and a board member of the Absican Light Lighthouse. Evan co-founded Authentic City Partners in 2016 to create development projects in Atlantic City with a singular commitment to better the lives of those in our community. ACP's first project is the Tennessee Avenue Renaissance, which includes Heyday, a community-centered coffee shop he started with two of his oldest friends. Next, we have Dr. Mary DeWilda Cologne, who is the Executive Director of the Stockton Center for Community Engagement and Professor of Social Work. In her position as the Executive Director, Dr. Cologne has established several homework completion programs in collaboration with the Atlantic City Police Department and the Atlantic City Housing Authority and Urban Development Agency, as well as the City of Pleasantville and the Pleasantville Police Department. She also initiated, among other projects, two programs for English learners and a naturalization course in our local community. Her areas of research include hospice, attitudes of Latinos toward, towards hospice, acculturation, and Latinos of, of, and community outreach. Next, we have Dr. Ellen Mutari, who is a professor of economics at Stockton University. Dr. Mutari is one of the co-authors, along with Dr. Deborah Feigert and Marilyn Power, of Living Wages, Equal Wages, Gender and Labor Market Policies in the United States. She is a past president of the Association for Social Economics and an editorial associate for the popular economics magazine, Dollars and Cents. She recently completed a study for Stockton's Hughes Center for Public Policy on sustainable economic development, the role of child care, modeling the potential impact for Atlantic City. And last but not least, we have Dr. Deborah Feigert, who is the Distinguished Professor of Economics at Stockton University. Dr. Feigert is the author of 18 books, monographs, or guest-edited academic journal volumes, including, most recently, Stories of Progressive Institutional Change, Challenges to the Neoliberal Economy. She is a past president of the Association for Social Economics and of the Association for Evolutionary Economics. Uh, both professors, Feigart and Mutari, are authors of the recent book, Just One More Hand, Life in the Casino Economy, which I highly recommend you all read. It, it's wonderful, and it gives such insight to, to life uh, in the casino industry. So we have a very uh, wonderful uh, panel that we're going to get started with our um, discussion. So the first question I have to the panelists are your immediate reactions of the film uh, and what reflections you might have after watching it. And I'll just open this up for anyone. Gee, those two economists were articulate. <laughs> 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 they were. <laughs> well, it still seems One of them relevant. looks really different, though, now. Oh, yes. I cut my hair and <laughs> donated it to um, Wigs for Cancer Research, Wigs for Cancer um, Patients. Um, it's still relevant mm -hmm. one and a half to two years later, I think, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And yet there is a sense in which that um, the film was made, I said 2015, but it obviously was 2016, given all the questions about Donald Trump. So I had to re replay that in my mind. Um, it, it was really sort of at, in economics, we might call the trough of, uh, of the business, the, the, the period in which things look the most dismal. Mm -hmm. And um, even within the casino industry itself now, we do see casinos reopening. The property that was the Taj Mahal is going to be a hard rock cafe. Revel is coming back as something. 
Ocean, uh, ocean one. something, yeah. Ocean, ocean, one. ocean something. Ocean Resort Casino. Ocean Thank Resort you. Casino. Um, so we're seeing that. We're seeing other things going on. And so, you know, there's a lot of ways in which it's still relevant, and the issues it raised are still relevant. We'll talk mm -hmm. about it, but there's also been some changes. Right. The issues it raised, uh, you can't just uh, redevelop the city by adding more casino yeah. jobs because the monopoly was lost years ago. Yeah. So I think that's what we're going to chat about tonight. Yeah, and I think that's a nice segue to the next question about gaming. And the film discusses the reason why gaming was so attractive. And it was the promise of tax revenue, this idea of good jobs, which I hope we, we talk about, lower crime rate and economic development for the city as a whole. Um, so what other industries then can offer the potential and attraction that the gaming industry did, once did for Atlantic City? Uh, Evan, do you want to get sure. started? So I think that at the end of the film, you talked about sort of the green economy. I think that that's a no-brainer for Atlantic mm -hmm. City. I think you look at sort of our natural assets. We're an urbanized barrier island. There aren't too many of those. We're in the Excella Corridor, where you have Boston to Washington, sort of all the human capital there. Um, it, it's certainly something that I've seen. And there was a report or sort of a study that came out, I think, from some sort of big design firm in New York. And it was in Fast Company. And I saw it, and they were talking about we have these big buildings that could be used, repurposed. You have mm -hmm. that human capital in the quarter. You have the wind. I saw that a Danish company, the largest in the world, basically just opened an office. That seems like a real no-brainer. And obviously, we're looking at what are industries of the future. Um, so I think that the point was made about the casino industry not giving up faith on that either. I think that makes a lot of sense too, right? There's still a lot of great jobs there. There's opportunities, I think, for as a model for service industry to have benefits, right? Atlantic City is one of the rare places that you can have a job in the service industry and have benefits. So mm -hmm. I don't think we want to give up on that either. But I think the green economy is, is a real no-brainer. I think um, the, the biggest challenge to business development to some degree is the that we are perceived as a one-trick pony. Um, mm -hmm. And that in business development, marketing, and economic development in general, marketing is such an important part of that. Um, so I think as we think about the challenges we have with one industry and sort of the sort of decline of that, we need to think about what are those other industries and we need to think about the narrative of Atlantic City as a whole so that it can be more attractive as we do business development. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard to, to be a planner and say, oh, uh, this is going to be our future or this is going to be our future or this is going to be our future, although I do agree the, the wind power and the ocean wave power is phenomenal, and we ought to be at the forefront of that in Atlantic City and certainly the state of New Jersey. Uh, I think it's important to continue to support the, what we're doing to revitalize the arts and arts industries in the state of New Jersey. Um, but it's hard to predict what's going to be popular in film or in music or in technology or what the next great company is going to be that starts in somebody's garage or from an idea in the sand or on the boardwalk. I think it's important to create the conditions, mm -hmm. um, the entrepreneurial conditions and the community conditions to make that happen and support people with that next great idea. There is one industry, though, that I, I think holds promise, not just for Atlantic City, but for the whole state of New Jersey. And I think that that's medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. Think about this. You have agriculture jobs. You have science and medical and pharmacy jobs. You have jobs in finance and jobs in retail. Mm -hmm. Um, jobs in distribution, jobs in, in trucking and, and manufacturing. There are so many backwards and forward linkages for that industry and what could potentially happen down the line from that with recreational use of marijuana. So I think you're, you're seeing a lot of challenges to old federal law and one of them is with the marijuana industry and the other is with the sports betting industry. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like us to build a little bit more on this idea of good jobs. Uh, I know it's an important concept in your book, and it was also mentioned in the film. What does it mean? What do people desire when they say they want a good job? And how can a community work to make sure that organizations and businesses can provide those jobs? So um, in our book, to give a little plug, we do <laughs> propose a definition 
of a good job that's broader than what a lot of economists look at. Mm -hmm. A lot of economists focus primarily on just wages, what the pay is, perhaps the benefits, a lot of the things that war signaled is very important in the movie and do matter. Um, but in a sense, those things, those material benefits, are part of the idea that a, um, what a good job does is it helps you build a life. Um, and to build a life, part of that, yes, is pulling in income, um, having benefits, but it's also ensuring that you have health, safety, well-being, that those things are not undermined by your, by your jobs. And one of the things that we found, there's kind of two stories we found about the casino industry. One that gets alluded to there is the deterioration of the quality of the jobs. That um, as the ownership of the casinos became more concentrated and financialized, uh, there were fewer full-time jobs, benefits were eroding, et cetera. But one constant problem with the casino jobs was that most of the casinos other than Revel were smoking. So, for example, if a woman got pregnant, she didn't want to stay in her job because, and so women in the early days would cycle in and out of employment um, if they got pregnant, but that's when there were jobs that you could go back to it if you took time off. Um, and other kinds of health and safety hazards. So those things are important. And then the woman who was becoming a phlebotomist also talked about the idea of having, a, that being a phlebotomist made her feel like she was doing something good in the world. And so I think having a sense of purpose in your job is really, really important. And what we saw is that people in the casino industry really struggled. To the extent that casinos promote gambling addiction, people didn't feel good about that. But to the extent that they could help people have a good time, help people relax, those kinds of things, they could feel good about it. It's not something that casinos have to be bad at. Um, but that is important. To, and, at minimum, even if you don't have a sense of purpose, it's important to have a sense of dignity at the job. That employers treat you with respect, treat you, and for those of you, if you're in the audience, students, and you're going to be, be a manager, one of the most important things to being a good boss is to recognize the people who work for you as human beings of worth and dignity, and treat them as that, and not just lie an entry on your accounting sheet. That's so important. Mm -hmm. And not only did we find that employees wanted all those things mm -hmm. in the casino industry, but Gallup polling organization yeah. has found that workers want this nationwide. Sure. What makes the casino industry particularly challenging for that, and uh, union president uh, Bob McDevitt talked about it in the film, is the seasonality of the mm -hmm. jobs, the part-time nature of the jobs, and as well as the cuts and the slashing of benefits. But what employees want uh, and, and they're finding it more and more difficult to get in today's gig economy with gig work mm -hmm. and part-time work and temporary work or the Uber economy or the Lyft economy or the TaskRabbit economy. They want stable, predictable, full-time hours. They don't want to be called in at strange hours mm -hmm. or unsocial hours. With casino work, it's middle of the night hours. Mm -hmm. And how can you build a life how can you balance work and family without stable, predictable hours? And that's really hard in casinos, and it's hard nationwide. And the other thing employees really want is some sick leave and some personal time mm -hmm. off, because we all have lives, mm -hmm. and they want that as well. And as you talk about lives, that's the biggest challenge, because from the community angle, how do you partake in activities in yes. the community? You can't. Right. You're tied to a certain schedule. Your children, many times they're dropped them. And actually, in your book, you talk about it. Parents dropping off kids for the second shift, you know, the, the other partner to pick them up, take them home. And it's a constant struggle to balance all of that. So how do you bring a community together mm -hmm. to feel that sense of pride and invest together mm -hmm. in human capital, in what each can bring? Exactly. It's very difficult, mm -hmm. very difficult. And I just want to say that these things are important not just for the individuals, they're important for building sustainable communities. Because, um, you know, a lot of times we focus, economists like to talk about capital. So there's manufactured capital, you know, things like the fact you have buildings and casinos. And there's financial capital. But social capital is really important. Communities that have networks where people know each other, they trust each other, where there's bonds of reciprocity, 
have much more resiliency in the face of economic downturns than communities that don't have that. If we're not investing, you mentioned human capital, if we're not investing in the next generation of workers and people, communities don't thrive. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason good jobs are important because Profits can go anywhere in the world to be reinvested. You know, a casino can make money here and put it into a, a, a casino in Macau, China. But mostly wages get spent nearby. So that's another reason that wages are so essential to local communities. And that's, wages are actually people. Yeah. And the income people make and spend in their communities is central to the future of economic development in the area. I want to talk now about this idea of community revitalization mm. and maybe start with um, Mary DeWilda if you want to offer some thoughts and then Evan. Mm. When we think of community revitalization, what comes to mind and, and how would you approach this idea? I think that all community members need to have equal opportunity to environmental resources that mm -hmm. are there, an open park, mm -hmm. in the time to enjoy it, opportunities for culture, we talk about the arts. Mm -hmm. You need to have opportunities to experience it, to embrace it, to be part of it. We're organizing an event that I'm part of right now, uh, 48 Blocks. Yeah. Amazing, Latinos are telling me, you know, you want us to go and perform. I don't know how I can do that. I need babysitter, I need a change in schedule, I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think about them and I think how do we revitalize when what I hear is people saying to me, come and talk to me, but this is the time I have. Mm -hmm. I'm doing homework with children, and the parents say to me, thank you, because I have two jobs. Yeah. I have three jobs. I don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. So to me, to revitalize, we have to have living wages mm -hmm. with social work hours so people can actually be part of the community. Absolutely. Otherwise, we can bring all the industries we want to bring, and people will continue to come up with a product and give you the labor bonds, but that will begin and end at that. Mm -hmm. Very difficult, mm -hmm. very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Not that it cannot be done. I, I want to be part of it. I think mm -hmm. I'm part of it, mm -hmm. but we all need to be part of this. Mm -hmm. Evan? I think what Dr. Cohen talked about in sort of access and opportunity is, is something that I think about a lot in Atlantic City in particular, and I think we have to recognize um, what casinos did and didn't do for Atlantic City. Um, obviously, that was the one industry that we focused a lot of attention on. Um, the poverty in Atlantic City is still endemic, still 37% federal poverty level. So more than one in three people in Atlantic City are impoverished. Um, that was probably the same in 2006, I would assume. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to think about um, what opportunities are coming to Atlantic City and how we provide equal access. Um, that's a really important question. I think what everybody's been talking about, sort of a revitalization of spirits and civic pride is a critical piece to the puzzle as well. I think the arts and culture are a big driver of that. I think 48 Blocks is a great initiative for the city that recognizes and celebrates our cultural richness, our diverse city, and all that we already have in Atlantic City. But Dr. Cologne brings out great points. If people can't engage and access it, um, we need to be thinking about that. So I think um, we really need to ask for whom is sort of all of this revitalization mm -hmm. happening okay. um, and, and what does it mean for the city itself and then the surrounding area. And I think that that's something that, um, if we look at Atlantic City as our city, right, in South Jersey, I think that it can be a paradigm shift and say, hey, this is our city. We're gonna really work to improve our city, but we're gonna recognize what's great about our city already. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really important part of the discussion. And who are those actors then that we can look to to build on this idea of community revitalization? Well, I always think the residents of the mm -hmm. immediate location, we're all for Atlantic mm -hmm. City, with Atlantic City, but there are people who are living there daily. The majority are renting space. And as they say to me, you know, when you rent space in a place, you don't know how long you get to be in that one place. So how do we look at that intersectionality of all those factors, you know, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, their religion, their values, uh, all these lives that are in the individual as part of a larger system that, as many say to me, I've tried to buy a place. I can't afford it. I can't build up my credit. I can't mm -hmm. do all these things. You're telling me to try to open a business. I can't. I don't have credit. And I try this and I try this other thing and I'm still renting. And I've been renting over 40 years. I have one woman who plays um, cards with us 
once a month. She's been at this one building 43 years renting. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when she, she says to me, I appreciate what you do. You're bringing opportunities to us that cannot afford anything because we, we earn very little. And her work was cleaning. She said, I didn't make a whole lot cleaning. In retail, you don't make a whole lot of money. So what is left to enjoy the, the good that life can bring, as they put it? So how do we work within the individual situation and thinking about these structural systems? And so I, I keep thinking about these residents that are, that are renting or that, that own a place in Atlantic City and how do we work with them one-on-one -on, -one on this? That, that's, that's what I Absolutely. want to see happening daily. How do we involve them to tell us what they want, how they want it? Yeah. And it's a long-run yeah. viewpoint. It's, it's hard to think about the long run when the short run is so painful. But to revitalize for the long run, to make it sustainable, and sure, home ownership is part of the American dream. Uh, but it's only part. What we need is living wages and a livable city. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by a livable city in Atlantic City and, and cities nationwide is cradle to grave livability. Mm -hmm. We need jobs for multiple generations and community centers and daycare centers for the young and elder care places for the retired. Um, and things to do in the evening for families and weekends for families and the evenings for millennials and the next generation and the generation after that. We have to think about a city growing many, many generations. You don't want people to leave the city, for example, when it's time for the kids to go into the schools right. because the public schools aren't good. So the schools have to be good. The hospitals have to be good. Daycare has to be good and high quality. Um, healthcare has to be good, so people are not exiting every time they need a, a hip replaced or something like that. So I'm thinking cradle to grave, livability, multiple generations. And that's really important because a lot of schemes for revitalizing poor communities focus on, let's bring the young people, the college <laughs> students and the 20-somethings, and have them come and move in for a few years. But then, for example, I live in Philadelphia right now. I used to live close to Atlantic City. Um, and we have lots of people in their 20s, and we have lots of retirees, but people still go out to the suburbs when they have to raise their kids. And we don't, that to have a truly livable city, a sustainable community, people need to stay over the life cycle. And that's a real challenge. That takes public services. Mm -hmm. That takes public investment. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not something that just happens. And business investment as yeah. well. But and I think the commitment to that vision is critical. And I think that, again, thinking about Atlantic City as a city first, mm -hmm. then our city is important in that because I think, you know, when I look at sort of the language that use, that's used about Atlantic City, oftentimes it's sort of a resort town. You know, it's mm -hmm. not focused on locals. You guys mentioned in the movie, you know, we need to think about what is attractive to community um, and, and not necessarily just focus on what's attractive to tourists. I don't think they're necessarily always the same. They can be, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's an important part of it. I think there are a lot of sticky capital institutions in Atlantic City. Obviously, you guys are coming to Atlantic City. Um, I think that you can play a great role, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, more. I think the casinos themselves are getting more engaged, and I think they realize mm -hmm. that they are more aligned with the city than they're not aligned with the city, right? And I think that that's an important thing. Maybe before, it didn't necessarily matter when you have a monopoly, um, whereas mm -hmm. now they have to create a thriving city and I think you can do that where you have an experience in and out of casinos, locals and tourists alike, and I think that they're realizing that more as I, I talk to them. Um, but I think that one thing that you talked about, Deb, sort of this idea of, of, you know, we have to attract, we have to retain, we have to develop talent. Uh, Atlantic City and the surrounding area is one of the worst for brain drain, right? So a lot of the human capital that we develop here, and we don't develop enough for sure, mm -hmm. leaves the area. And I think that that's a major challenge. Um, and I've, I've seen that with trying to recruit talent to come back, um, having Atlantic City itself be more livable, because a lot of people that I know actually would prefer to live in a city. They don't find it yet that Atlantic City is that city. So mm -hmm. I think that that's an important piece of the equation, too. Absolutely. Can you talk a little more about what you're doing and the kinds of initiatives yeah, you're do. doing? Sure. <laughs> Happy to. Um, <laughs> 
so I, I wear many different caps and I always think about sort of, you know, the different angles and how they come together with the renaissance of Atlantic City. And I'm focused exclusively on Atlantic City. I, I live in Atlantic City, I work in Atlantic City, everything I do with nonprofit is in Atlantic City. Uh, I think focus is critical. Um, the project that I'm working on right now from a business perspective is the Tennessee Avenue Renaissance. And what we're really trying to do there is create a destination, a critical mass of amenities for people that want to visit Atlantic City, that want to live in Atlantic City. So we're starting with a focus on food and beverage and also sort of uh, services. So we have a yoga studio that's already opened with Grace and Glory, which is offshore here. They have a location in Philadelphia. They have a nonprofit arm that they've created called the Leadership Studio. Um, we are in the process of opening a wine and chocolate shop um, with great talent that was in the casinos that's now moving out, uh, Chef Deb Pellegrino and her husband, Mark. Um, it's a really unique concept, kind of gets back to the roots of Atlantic City, uh, sort of making really cool things. So they're gonna be mm -hmm. making chocolate, being the bar on Tennessee Avenue, Atlantic City. We're opening an independent coffee shop called Heyday. Again, leaning into the brand of Atlantic City. William Heyday was the, not the inventor, but sort of the, the mass marketer of the rolling chair. Realized, hey, everybody might wanna go on one of these on the sure. boardwalk. So that's, there is not an independent coffee shop in Atlantic City. Wow. That is shocking yeah, to anybody that's ever been to a city. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a center of community. So we're really trying to do that there. Um, and then there's the Tennessee Avenue Beer Hall, which is a craft beer, gastropub type of place with big outdoor space. And that's just phase one. And then we're really trying to attract like-minded developers that really want to build a mixed use center of the city. Um, so Atlantic City has obviously the big boxes with casinos. We really want to unbox the city because especially place. young people place, yeah. are, are looking, and everybody realistically, young, old, tourists, <laughs> local, everybody's kind of looking for the same things. They're looking for authentic experiences in urban environments. Mm -hmm. And so we really are leaning into Atlantic City right now and really trying to bring uh, concepts that people are passionate about that are Atlantic City focused and really high quality. So that's well, that's what, one what, piece of what it. What you're doing is contributing to a livable city. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. think about the typical household, which is uh, two adults and something like 2.3 children. I know you can't slice a child, okay? But I'm talking about averages here. So let's think about their typical day. They're gonna get up and have breakfast together, hopefully. You're gonna send the, the kids off to school or you need daycare or some kind of childcare, quality childcare facility at a reasonable price for that family. You need jobs for that household, for people going off to make livable wages. Or maybe they went to a yoga class before work and then they went off to work and then after work you pick up the kids, maybe you have a date night so you go out to dinner or you go to a lecture or an event at Stockton or you hear music or down at a club <laughs> or you get some chocolate and you hear music down at a club. Sure. We need all of those things sure. in our city. And I think that again, if you think about Atlantic City as our city, you start to see these things happening. I think that for a long time, um, and this happened in a lot of cities. Uh, Atlantic City may be a little bit more concentrated. It's a smaller city, which I think is a real opportunity because you can see interconnectivity a lot easier in a smaller mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can start to solve some of the problems that Atlantic City is faced with, which are similar problems to many other cities, Philadelphia included, um, we can create some scale. So I think that, that to me is why Atlantic City has this microcosm of you know, 25 different languages spoken in one of the schools, representing 40 different countries. We're one of the most diverse places on earth. We have this incredible concentration of anybody and everybody. And we have a lot of the unique, or we have a lot of the not unique big city problems in a small city. But if you can sort of focus on that as a positive right. and say the density and the diversity provide us an opportunity to innovate and incubate and iterate, mm -hmm. um, wow, what could we be solving? And that's why I agree with you. You can't necessarily figure out what the f industries of the future are. I think you can start to see some of them coming together now. But if you make Atlantic City an attractive place for people to want to solve real world problems, mm -hmm. um, the amount of human capital that you can develop, or attract, exactly. retain is incredible. Because I think the, the bones are there. Um, but it's about packaging it to some degree. And that's why I say marketing is critical to economic development, it's criti critical to community development. I think it's, it's something that maybe is one of our weakest points, honestly. Um, maybe because we didn't have to do that from the casino perspective, it just happened. Um, but now we have that unique opportunity to say, how do we package all these really um, unique, not yet, not too unique um, things so that you can create scale with the mm -hmm. challenges. And I think so. because the documentarians were focused on poverty and they were doing the film in a particularly bad year. 
there's a kind of a tone to the film that's focusing on some of the negative things about Atlantic City in recent years. But um, what I think one of the things you're doing is conveying is that there is such a deep, wonderful history and community in Atlantic City that is such an amazing place that we live near. And um, I don't think, I think it's important we're going to segue to talking about um, Stockton and Atlantic City, but I think it's so important that we don't just think of it as, oh, we're going there to help. Or I think of it as some kind of charity. There is so much richness and diversity um, and history that we can learn from and participate in by being a part of Atlantic City. Yeah, I think and that. The, the point of that really is the resiliency. I mean, through all this adversity, and families are there, they haven't left. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we can't lose sight of it's again, they are experts of their situation and their resiliency, it's amazing. And that's, that's what drives me, Absolutely. to see how much they want to be in Atlantic City. And they want Atlantic City to mm -hmm. be different, mm -hmm. to, to have what it used to have. And that's what they thrive for every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the history is so rich. And I think it's something that we might lose sight of at times. But you really can't. I mean, it's the city where Nina Simone became Nina Simone. It's wow. the, mm -hmm. the city where Kentucky Avenue, with all of the amazing jazz clubs, the jazz talent that came through Atlantic City. I mean, we have an incredibly rich history, and I know that times have been tough, and I, I agree that in the movie it feels like a devastating tone to some degree, and I think that was in the depths of the depths. Um, but we have a lot of rich history to call upon and sort of build from. I think it's important to recognize. If we could find a way to fund it in the state, can we go to Stockton for a moment? Let's, let's turn to <laughs> If we could find a way to fund it in the state, Atlantic City, New Jersey, and Atlantic County, New Jersey, is still one of the locations in metropolitan areas with the a small percentage of its of its adult citizens with a college degree. So if we could find a way to help people get a leg up and study at our new campus in Atlantic City for one of the new emerging fields of in the labor market of the future that would help create a sustainable, livable city in the long mm -hmm. run. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a great transition. We know that opening a building is only a series of steps to foster a collaboration between uh, people who live in the city and the students and faculty and staff who will be working there. Uh, what other considerations should we take into account to make sure that that relationship is a mutually beneficial relationship and one that um, just questions that we should we should be aware about at where as we start this relationship. Well, I think that again I spoke about intersectionality of factors mm -hmm. and, and looking at individuals as individuals and not just as a mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. So inevitably we're going to make mistakes, mm -hmm. I, and others have because it's going to be very difficult to pretend that we know when we're not experts. <laughs> in Atlantic City life mm. and ways of living, right? So we have great intentions, but we have to admit that ultimately if we don't listen, we're going to make mistakes. Absolutely. So I think that's, that's uh, if we want to have a mutually beneficial relationship, you can't have that if you don't listen. Both have Absolutely. to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, to me, we need to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Or else we're really going to find that frustration that others sure. have experienced. And, mm -hmm. and I think that there's so much richness in all this that we shouldn't lose sight if we just open that dialogue and open the walls of the university mm -hmm. uh, and bring the community. And we have to go in the community, be part of that community. Mm -hmm. It can't be just the, the nice building mm -hmm. on its own. That, that can't quite be if, if we are intentional about this. So. I, I, I think that's a really important part. I think a building can be a fortress, actually. Um, and a city as small as Atlantic City, you might think you can sit in that building and things will happen. I think I've learned the exact opposite. You have to get out into Atlantic City. It's a city of neighborhoods, um, and you need to go out to the city to really listen first. I think that it's great to come in and say, hey, we can be positive and, and make change, but understanding what that change is from the community is really important. I know you do a lot of that listening, Dr. Cullen. I think that that's a critical piece of it. Um, I think there are models 
of places that are doing this well, and the Netter Center is one of them at UPenn, which is our neighbor, and I think that it makes sense to at least look at that model sure. personally um, to sort of see what can be learned from what they're doing. Um, but I think listening, one, and also setting expectations is important because I think there's a history in Atlantic City, and you hear this in the movie, of sort of this um, silver bullet and there are no silver bullets. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not one industry or one thing or one campus or one university that's going to sort of make the difference, um, but a lot of small things over time. But that is frightening because I do talk to still my old neighbors and people who live in Atlantic City, Ventnor, communities around there, and there are such high expectations right now. It's as if Stockton is going to be the next thing, and somehow Stockton just building this building there is going to turn everything around. I've even, you know, I've talked to people who sort of think automatically this means you know, I should be investing in real estate and I should be doing this, and that's like, no, the, you know, first of all, we've got to get away from the idea that there's only, that just one thing is going to fix everything. And secondly, I mean, the good thing is the building that we're building doesn't look like a box with no windows, <laughs> you know, that's designed to bring busloads of people in and, leave the, and have busloads leave, which is what the casinos were built for originally. Uh, you know, we have windows. We're, we're designed to interact with the community, and I think that that's a good first step. Um, but uh, it is important that we do look at models um, about ways in which any anchor institution, which is the lingo for this anchor that he was alluding to, um, like Penn serves in Philadelphia. The thing about colleges and often hospitals is that they're called what economists call sticky capital meaning you can close a casino here and open one somewhere else, and that probably doesn't matter. But you can't just close Stockton here and open it in Iowa. Uh, you can't, it tends to be associated with a place. And so what we need to do is build that association with place, but then create the ripples that Deb was talking about, I think, in the movie and also here by making sure that we're subcontracting to local businesses, that we're nourishing providers, um, provision, you know, institutions are gonna, local institutions that are creating jobs and providing us with some of the, the, thing, the resources and the inputs that we need to uh, run the institution there, that we're hiring people in the local community, which I know we've had initiatives to do with training and job fairs and so forth. All of that stuff is really important to make sure that the way we're doing this is creating ripple effects for other businesses or multiplier effects for other businesses. I want and, to. And oh, Evan sorry. talked about not having a fortress. Yes. And Awilda talked about basically going on a listening tour and listening to the community. And this is a challenge for our university, but I think we need to bring community members in mm -hmm. to the university and the Atlantic City campus mm -hmm. through programming, through events. Um, it, we are part of that community. So that community needs to be invited in to this space mm -hmm. through s summer volleyball tournaments on the beach. I don't know, but listen to the community and l let's figure it out so we can be partners. Which 48 Blocks has been doing. Yes. saxon has been working with the arts community um, and others, Joyce Hagen, who is here, um, is one of the spearheaders of that. And I know you've both been involved, and that's really important because that's a collaboration between people in the arts and humanities here at Stockton and people in the community in building a series of programs. Take, keep an eye out for that. Come to that. When is it, Joyce? 48blocksac.com. Yeah. <laughs> Check I want to throw out one more question and then maybe take some questions from the audience. Uh, when we think about community revitalization, we also think about sustainability. Mm -hmm. So what should we think about when we hear this term sustainability, and in particular with the Atlantic City uh, and, and the Stockton campus? Well, for me, sustainability is a very broad term, and that's going to hit Absolutely. on things that we've talked about. I mean, it's in, usually people think in terms of environmental sustainability, and that's very important in a small space. As you said, a barrier island, 48 blocks long, it, there, there's a limited amount of space there. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very aware of environmental impact, both understanding the natural resources that we have, but also understanding that they're not inexhaustible, that we have to find ways to replenish them um, and not diminish them. 
them. But that same approach can be brought to other resources as well. So we've thrown around the word human capital several times on the um, panel, and part of that has to do with, that's the idea that we have, as human beings, have productivity to contribute to the economy. Um, and all the students who are here, you are in college in part to augment your human capital so that you are more desirable to employers. Well, that's something we have to think about because as that's not shouldn't be just individuals' responsibility. Sure. That's a community responsibility to ensure that human capital is nourished and replaced, that human beings are nourished and replaced. And so Deb mentioned childcare. Um, I did a study for the Hughes Center, you mentioned in my bio, on the need for um, funding childcare and the ways in which that has stronger ripple effects and multiplier effects in local communities. Because it has a threefold impact um, on economic development. First, it makes the parents themselves more stable employees if they've got, know their kids are safe and they don't have to just kind of uh, worry about insecure childcare. It then raises the next generation and it provides an industry that tends to be small local businesses that reinvest and purchase money, uh, purchase supplies locally. So it tends to have higher multiplier effects than a lot of other industries. So that's one example of human um, sustainability that we need to think about as well. And I was talking about multiple generations of sustaining sure. yeah, humans. Exactly. And and Awilda was talking about the social capital, not exactly. just the human capital, that they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Building communities and networks, that's mm -hmm. important. I think seasonality is also an important thing to talk yes. about. Sustainability sure. for Atlantic City in particular. I think uh, Bob McDevitt talked about sort of, you know, pre casinos people would work a few months and then sort of live off of unemployment. And I think we've got to think about making Atlantic City feel less boom and bust in the cycles. So, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we're opening new businesses, people say, well, you got to get them open by Memorial Day or Fourth of July because you can only hit the season and then you can't make it. And I think that that's a very challenging environment sure. uh, for the businesses themselves from an employment perspective, from mm -hmm. a lot of different reasons. But um, I think we've got to think about how do we make it so that it's less, you know, sort of peaks and valleys and a little bit more even. So that's the sustainability I think, think about. Um, and, and I think that that will help people think about li the livability of Atlantic City mm -hmm. more too when you think about it as a year-round place mm -hmm. to, I hate to say it, live, work, and play. Right. <laughs> and ironically, what a university does is exactly flip that exactly. because our prime time is fall to spring, mm -hmm. um, whereas a traditionally Atlantic City's mm -hmm. prime time was summer. And can I make one final comment about sustainability? Sure. We want this beautiful barrier island of 48 blocks and our Stockton University campus to be there in, as we get ready for our 50th uh, anniversary, another 50 years yeah. or another 100 years. So we have to make sure that rising sea levels don't take over this precious bit of Absolutely. land. So we have to think about climate change. Mm -hmm. And I had a comment about children. Yeah. Uh, we have about 10,000 children in Atlantic mm -hmm. City. So if we don't work with these children, and uh, there's a, a group of us, organizations of Atlantic City, and I'm invited into this from Stockton, and we're looking at child development models so that everything I do at the homework programs that I run and everything that the Boys and Girls Club does and other organizations that are working with children, we can agree on certain tenets that then we can use in the schools, in our after school mm -hmm. programs so that we can measure outcomes. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to sustain the city, we, we have to count on these children. Mm -hmm. And they have to have a sense of pride in their community early mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So we're working towards that. So we should look at it. I'd now like to open it up for the audience. Uh, anyone who has a question or a comment? Yes. <laughs> My question is, what can Stockton do in its first semester out there that would show the community that we are part of the community, that we want to listen to the community? Can you be more specific with what your advice would be? I like the beach volleyball, but <laughs> things like that. that Thank you. How do we actually go out and hear what people say and then do things that will be meaningful so they'll know we're serious about being part of the community? That's you too. 
Well, we already, um, we already have programs. You don't even have to wait to the first yeah. semester. <laughs> uh, just come by and begin um, visiting and being part of what we have already going because we do have uh, plenty of activities going on in places where all of us from Stockton can already be present and not quite wait to the building uh, to open its doors. And once it does open, I have to tell you, there are a number of groups in the community who have said, when and what room can we use? Mm. Uh, they want, they already are they waiting for us space. to say, what's the space like? And uh, as you know, the Boys and Girls Club is one of those organizations waiting because they feel that if children come into this building and they're part of this building early on, there is an understanding that this is a university. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about the importance of educating children. Mm -hmm. And for instance, um, African-American and Latino children, you don't tend to see that they grow up to be in vocational trade. If you look at mm -hmm. uh, electricians, plumbers that we have even in New Jersey, as kids say to me, they say, you know, our parents are not part of that group. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking they can go to college. College mm -hmm. can be it. So I think that opening the door for a child to already see and walk into a building and know this is what we call university. Mm -hmm. Because when I bring them here from Stanley Homes Village, the children said to me, so where's the university? Yeah. And I'm like, you're standing. This is it. This is it. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have a notion of what necessarily that is. And that's the age when we need to reach out, when they're still very much looking forward to a future. Mm -hmm. So I, I am already so <laughs> uh, to, to be part of this. And, and go out, but also have them come into yeah. the building because they want to be there. Mm -hmm. I think you know, oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Um, I appreciate the question. I think it's important in the first six months and indeed the first year to know that the residents of Atlantic City are interested and smart and care about their future and the city's future. And we need to have a lot of open houses and we need to figure a way, uh, logistically and legal-wise, to replicate some of our open houses on the main campus for prospective students and day in the life where you get to hear a faculty member, or you get to visit a class, or you get to hear a talk. And then it gives you an opportunity to listen to that community member and also to recruit them and hear what their needs are for their future education or their continuing education or professional development. And then we can create programming to help meet those needs. Kevin, did you want to? I think the, the biggest thing, and I agree that you already are doing this now, um, which is really important. Um, making sure that people in Atlantic City feel like it is for them is really important. So I feel like implicitly there's sort of this idea that certain things are for us and for them. And I think that it really, really is an important thing to sort of start to break that down because the city can be very siloed. It's very small, but it can be very siloed. And I think that I've, I've talked to people at the Boys and Girls Clubs where kids don't necessarily realize things are for them. And I think to be fair, it's kind of clear that it's not. Um, so I don't think they're wrong. And I think that it's really important for Stockton to be very clear that it is for people in Lang City, of, especially at an early age, so that they really understand that. Um, and representation really matters, right? So they need to see people that look like them, that are like them, that are involved. And I think what you said earlier, and everybody here has echoed, listen first, right? Stop prescribing and go out and listen and go on that listening tour and bring people back to the space and make sure that it's open um, because you have to build bridges in Atlantic City. You have to build bridges in cities in general, but again, I think that's a unique opportunity. You can literally go out and meet almost every single person in Atlantic City if you want to. You can make that as a goal. We're gonna talk to 40,000 people. You can do it. It's smaller than neighborhoods in New York like, or Philly. Mm -hmm. So it's a real opportunity to really get out there and make sure that people know that Stockton is for them. Want to take another question? Are there any cultural events planned for the park outside where Stockton's being built? Is that, what's the name of that park right in front O'Donnell of the park. War Memorial? Um, I know 48 Blocks is gonna have yeah, an issue. Yeah. They did last, they did last year. year, yeah. yeah. But, but my comment is that Stockton should be engaging in that park area, having open areas to, for them to come in and uh, mm -hmm. cultural events in that park possibly. 
but I was just commenting to that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. my comment is about the financial stability. Um, I have relatives in the police and fire department within Atlantic City, and uh, the, the city itself financially is in disaster. So what are we doing as far as that's concerned um, as a community? There's no sustainability there. They can't afford to live. I know people who've had their pays cut more than 60%. Their health benefits cut and their hours increased. So when you talk about sustainability, um, I particularly know a firefighter who has four children and is now working a second job. Oh. It's not a unique problem to Atlantic City, obviously. Um, it's a prob The disinvestment in public services is a problem throughout the United States. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't have any magic cure. I just try to talk about it in my economics classes, right? Well, That's about all I can do, a few people at a time. Well, there is a long story of decades of the state extracting a lot of the uh, casino revenues from the city and not returning back as much to the city as the mm -hmm. city needed. And then there was the state takeover of the city and the city mm -hmm. would like its own home rule back for a better future. So there's a, there's a long story and saga there mm -hmm. that certainly needs to be explored. I'd say we got to grow our way out of it. I think that that's a big thing, right? So if you if you lose more than half your tax base, right, with sort of casinos and the fall of, of several casinos, right? So you look at your tax base and you say it was sliced by you guys know better than me, 50%, 60%, right? So you lose a, you know you lose a lot of that right there. Not even to get into what the city never received, but I think that you from from my perspective, from a business perspective, we have to make Atlantic City more attractive to businesses to want to do business there. Uh, and I think that it's a perception thing to some degree, but there are some realities. Um, I'd love to see, in addition to you know Hard Rock, I'd love to see a business that isn't gaming related sort of make a big announcement to say, hey, Atlantic City is open for business. Stockton is great. Again, we talk about these anchor institutions, great South Jersey industries. Those are utilities and schools. That's not, uh, you know, you know, Amazon's gonna pick an East Coast space. Well, maybe they pick New York or Newark. How does Atlantic City get a little bit of that, right? Just to change the perception. Mm -hmm. And then you get one and then you can build from it. So I think really focusing on how do we grow, create uh, a sustainable economic development model, that's a really critical piece to sort of getting back to the municipal levels that we need to really sustain the city. I agree with you, Evan. Um, I would like to add that a sustainable economic development model is not city after city or state after state or county <laughs> after county competing yeah. for the next Amazon by giving away the store. And giving uh, away the tax Giving base. away the taxes for 25 years or 30 years yeah. because then that places the burden on the residents. Sure. So right. I support entrepreneurship. I support business. I really do. But business is also part of the community and needs to be part of the finances of that community and pay their fair share to that community. With, without a doubt. And I think really, I think small business is going to be a bigger driver for Atlantic City and sort of seeing more of that. My business partner and I talk about sort of letting a thousand flowers bloom in Atlantic City. You talk about Atlantic City as a had really super thriving small business scene and really, although there are still small businesses there, of course, um, it's a real opportunity for growth. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, I think businesses are... are corporate citizens, or however you want to put it, they're part of the community. And I think engaging the businesses as well is a really important part of the Atlantic City story moving forward. But I found that a lot of businesses want to be involved um, mm -hmm. in certain ways uh, or as much as they can. So I feel like even to be fair to the casinos, they're really looking at how they can engage in community more and more. But it is important to remember that the tax revenues that were put on specific to the casinos primarily went to the state. Sure. And yet, Casino industry brought a lot of people to Atlantic City, tourists, to Atlantic City to gamble. It created issues in terms of 
criminal behavior and so forth that, you know, associated with the casinos that the state needed to take responsibility. Local property taxes shouldn't have been, it shouldn't be the entire tax base for funding our police fire services in a, particularly in a community that was in a sense a money maker for the whole state for so long. So I think the state owes the city. Yeah, I think what you're suggesting is the support for public services yeah. is for full-time residents. But when you have people coming in that are right. double, triple, quadruple, right. the full-time residents, you need services right. for all of those people, the argument, even though they're visiting. The argument would get made that, oh, Atlantic City has a high police budget given its population. Well, its population of residents is not who they're servicing. Those police are servicing a whole lot of tourists coming in, too. So that's been a way in which that's been mis um, skewed in an inappropriate way. I think we have time for one more question. Or I think Joyce had one. Um, I just wanted to say, as people ask, as Stockton folks ask what they can do in Atlantic City, and mm -hmm. indeed you, you um, Mary DeWild is there all the time, and her comments have been to listen, but I would also stress that it's going to be really important for everyone who listens to also be very patient, because the population of Atlantic mm -hmm. City has been assaulted, not really assault, I don't mean assaulted, but they've been promised and promised yeah. and promised and promised from the state and other entities that help was on its way. Right. And agencies have come in and moved through town. Dollars have been spent in misguided ways. Yes. And so there, while there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm and people who are looking forward to being able to interface and interact with Stockton, there's also going to be an awful lot of caution and guardedness about being let down again. So I, I think it's really important to have that attitude that this is going to take much longer than you probably anticipate yeah. because of all the injuries that have already been foisted on a lot of the population, or at least that's how they regard it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I just wanted to mention that. I think this goes to setting expectations, though, too, Joyce. And I, this is something we talk about is, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. The mm -hmm. timeline that my business partner and I talk about is forever. Um, so we, we really think that that's I, I totally agree with you. I thought when I moved back to the area from New York, I thought, okay, what can happen in 12 months or 18 months or 36 months? And I think that being back, I've reset expectations because of sort of how many false promises there's been, the inertia that was built up cyclically, and I think in the city, I think that's another thing that the casinos did not necessarily address those for people mm -hmm. in the city. Um, and so sort of, I think this is something that the movie alludes to a little bit, sort of uh, the divide between the county and the city. Yes. And so it's really important to, to keep that in mind. I totally agree with you. Agree. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? More. Oh, Look. one more? Oh, we have one more. Sure. We can do that. Yes, please. Um, thank you, first of all, for having the panel discussion. It really is um, important for the community. I just had a quick comment. I'm born and raised in Atlantic City, has spent all of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in real estate now. I noticed you mentioned the problem with people renting and not being able to buy. And then I think Deb covered some of the issues also with the taxes and with the state. I found that, for the most part, when the casinos came, there was no, I guess the taxes, they hadn't assessed any of the properties. So they were very, very low taxes. And then at the height of the market, they decided to do a tax assessment. Yes. And it skyrocketed really high. The average person could no longer afford to live in the city. Mm -hmm. And so what you have is, I, I said real estate also, you have a house across the street paying $12,000 or 10000 in taxes house directly across who have appealed their taxes, they're paying 3,000 or 4,000 in taxes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people in the city, and I'm talking specifically about Venice Park, Bungalow Park, they're bitter because they didn't have the knowledge to do an sure. appeal. They didn't right. understand the process. And so while everybody started celebrating Stockton, and I, I totally celebrate Stockton, I'm on the sassy board with Deb, and mm -hmm. I celebrate everything that the community does, I think the person that spoke about some apprehension is very correct. Right. They won't be able to embrace it because they won't feel like there's, that this is gonna help them. And mm -hmm. it's gonna take a little while for us to get to that place where people can see 
that this is not something that's going to be a one pony show yeah. or you know um, like you said it's going to have to come across in time but i think it's really important that the i think you evan spoke about the businesses and small businesses being in place atlantic avenue years ago was filled with all independent right. businesses right. and we have to get those people to come back we have to get them to come back on the boardwalk and actually see the ocean mm -hmm. okay and revitalization in terms of uh, I think someone spoke about a thousand uh, flowers. Visually, it has to be appealing. So when someone spoke about the park, I don't think Stockton has control of the park, but the park is going to be very important visually. Yeah. When you come in there, it should really be well lit. It should really be welcoming. People need to still feel tourists also safe. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different things. I love the fact that you had the discussion. We are all on board. I want to come, I want to support, I want to do anything I can to help the city. So I just want to say thank you and just have a comment. Thank you so much. Great. That's, well, that's actually, nice that's a wonderful Perfect way to, nice to wrap up. I want to thank the panelists for this wonderful discussion and their contributions, and I want to thank all of you for attending this evening. We have a reception afterwards, and we'd love to continue the conversation one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So please join us just right around the corner. Um, thank you so much.